Some key elements in this episode are, maybe depression hasn't always to be labeled as a negative emotion. Our goals are never rational. Pain has a function, so has joy, but it's not about making you happy. Losing a leg or winning a lottery, with regard to your long-term happiness, it's about the same. We are afraid when our body, not our mind, tells us to. Babies sometimes blackmail their mothers. In some cultures, there's no word for depression. Happiness is ultimately not found within yourself. Why didn't evolution wipe out bad things like anxiety, depressions, anorexia, psychosis, or compulsive disorders? They make our lives miserable, and in the extreme case can even end it. Not what evolution intended, isn't it? Well, it's not that simple. Saying mental diseases have a clear-cut function is a statement too bold to make. But in a sense, it often has an indirect one. In many cases, they help us to survive and thrive. The same goes for symptoms of physical diseases. Why, for example, do we cough? Prolonged and heavy coughing is quite unpleasant and hinders your daily functioning. But we all know coughing is a healthy natural reflex to clear your lungs and throat from irregularities. Not coughing would make the suffering worse in the long run. In this episode on evolutionary psychology, we explore what the mental equivalents of coughing are. In this, we will focus on, especially on depressions. But first, let's start with emotions. What are emotions exactly? How do they help us? How did they evolve? And what is the relationship between emotions and rationality? Are these separate domains or not? We have to understand this to really grab what depressions are all about. Let's start with a little thought experiment. How would a person look like who has no emotions at all? Would he be a rational robot like Dr. Spock in Star Trek? Would he be a merciless criminal killing people without remorse? A cold politician or businessman taking harsh cold decisions with no regard to the consequences or suffering of others? No, not at all. All these examples imply some emotions, like lust for power or money. No, someone without emotions would be like a plant, just sitting there, completely motionless. Hunger, thirst, nor heat or cold would have any effect on him, because this would imply the presence of at least some emotions. He would be a mental leper, and as will be clear, such a person could not exist, as he wouldn't even be able to grow up. Emotions, as the term implies, is that what set you in motion. Everything we do starts with emotions. Something has to touch us before we even turn our eyes on it, start thinking about it, and start doing things. So, 99.9% .9 of what is happening around us does not steer our attention or emotions. So, consequently, we are not aware of it. Just a very small part does attract our attention and moves us. Any goal we set in life, be it tiny daily ones or big endeavors, are first and for all dictated by emotions. Unless we find it at least a tiny bit important, it involves our feelings. We could say every goal we strive for, including the things we want to avoid, are emotional. Only after a goal is set, rationality comes in. And that's when to decide what's the most effective and efficient way to reach that goals. Goals are always emotional. Ways toward a goal can be rational. Wanting to have a beautiful car is a goal set by emotions. Maybe on a deeper level having to do with acquiring status to attract mates, strategies on the game of intersexual selection, have sex and procreate. Saving money is a rational strategy to attain this goal. Spending it on other things could be classified as non-rational. But the problem is, we do not have one goal, but many, and some of them oppose each other and reaching the one sometimes shuts out the other ones. But remember this, goals are always emotional. Ways toward it can be rational. Sometimes what seem goals are just steps to ultimate goals further away. So treat them as rational or irrational means instead of really end goals. When we accuse someone of not being rational, this often means we do not share his goals. We make the mistake to project our own goals on someone else's life. We think, what would I do if I would stand in his shoes and condemn him for irrationality, 
while in fact he has just chosen different goals from ours. Emotions put your body in the right mode for actions required. If suddenly a lion chases us, this will scare the hell out of you. Your heart rate will rise, extra oxygen is sent to your muscles, blood from, from your abdomen is sent to your arms and legs, and hormones are released to give you, give you this extra power. That's the first reflex. Shortly after this, the first intuitive cognitive assessment is made. Is it better to fight, to flight, or to freeze? Especially negative emotions operate very quick. We shift to action in a split second. Emotions are evolutionary calculators. Millions of years of evolution, not only as humans, but way back in evolution, even to our lives as reptiles and beyond that, have shaped a set of sharp and effective reflexes. Emotions are evolutionary calculators, starting the right mode of action on the right moment. Red, yellow and blue are the basic colors. All other colors are different mixtures of these basic colors. The idea is the same goes for emotions. Although there is still debate on what are exactly these basic emotions, a much supported model speaks of happiness, sadness, disgust, fear, surprise and anger. And just like with colors, all other emotions are mixtures of these basic building blocks. Each of them is associated with specific bodily states and actions. We spoke about what happens in your body when aggression set in, sets in. So the fight mode is activated. The fear mode much looks the same, only your face gets pale. So if you get wounded, you don't lose too much blood. In the freeze mode, you hold your breath and your heart rate plummets. In the state of disgust, disgust you vomit. It's a reaction to toxic substances you may have eaten and need to get rid of as soon as possible. But we know of many more emotions than the basic ones, and they are all built up of these basic building blocks. Being proud is a combination of happiness and anger. You smile and do all the things when happy, but at the same time you make a fist and anger pierces out of your eyes. You have beaten someone or something. Jealousy is a mixture of fear, sadness and anger. You can probably figure out yourself what these different building blocks contribute to the end result. Many emotions are what we call acceptations. We discussed this phenomenon in episode 4 of this series. Acceptation means existing structures attract new functions. A good example are the legs and wings of a cricket. Evolved to walk and fly, later they were used additional to make noise. The same happened in the evolution of emotions. When an animal gets his body hurt, he withdraws, keeps silence not to attract predators, and uses minimal energy to preserve time to recover. Human sadness uses the very same neurological structures, but now to heal mental wounds. When someone says he feels the pain of a loss of a friend, this phrase is not just metaphorical. In his brain, the same areas are activated as when he is suffering physical pain. The same goes for disgust. You can be disgusted by rotten food, but also by opinions and behaviors of other people. Again, the same neurological reactions take place. Using one tool for two purposes is just an example of evolutionary efficiency. It's important to make a sharp distinction between negative and positive emotion. Psychology has long, a bit one-sided, focused its attention and research on negative emotions on problems and mental dysfunctions. The emergence of positive psychology some decades ago changed all this. Barbara Fredrickson, for example, presented an elaborate model on positive emotion. She called it broaden and build. As you being happy is not a goal of evolution, where we strictly, of course, cannot speak of goals. She tried to figure out what the functions of positive emotions could be. Emotions serve your genes, not us. So, for negative emotions, like fear and disgust, it's clear. They help us to survive. But what about positive emotions? Fredrickson was one of the first to see positive emotions. They have survival functions too. Most young mammals play. It trains their muscles and reflexes. Curiosity helps you to discover your environment. And this helps you to survive. For example, you know where to hide in case of danger. Enjoying company 
helps you to build up social capital. You learn which people can help you in case of threats or other problems. So, feeling good is not about feeling good. It's about the survival of your genes. Earlier we stated negative emotions are a first physical response, immediately followed by a first cognitive assessment that leads to action, fight, flight or freeze. But sometimes emotions plus reactions come in tailor-made packages, as tailor-made inborn reflexes. We have a natural fear of big spiders and scorpions. We don't have to learn to be careful with big heights. Our fear for it is pre-programmed, as this is for dangerous predators and unknown males. Furthermore, some responses are much easier and quicker to condition than other ones. If you like herring, but one time consume one that wasn't quite fresh anymore, you probably will not eat a herring for many years after that, as happened with me. While other modern, much bigger dangers prove much harder to teach to children, like electric electricity or cars. Roughly speaking, we can say the bodily sensation comes first, and after that a cognitive assessment follows to analyze more in detail what is going on and decide on the right action. This of course all in a split second. And for this assessment, we have among other things, read our physical reactions. William James once made the joke, we know we are afraid of bears because we see ourselves running away. And there's a grain of truth in this. We have to give meaning to our bodily sensations to make sense of the situation. Bodily sensations on itself, without interpretation, are nothing. Some ingenious experiments have demonstrated how this works. Researchers showed several groups of subjects a movie, a scary, romantic, or a funny one. This in two conditions. One natural, and the other group was given, without them knowing it, some substances that caused physical arousal, like a higher heart rate, more heavy breathing, and a little sweating. After the movie, they asked the subjects to rate the movie on how scary, romantic, or funny they thought the movie was. And what appeared out of these data, the drug group gave much more extreme answers than the non-drug group. Apparently, we unconsciously thought, hey, I feel my heart beating, I'm breathing heavy, and I'm sweating. This must be because of the movie, movie. so it must be a very scary, funny, or romantic movie. A kind of misattribution with regard to bodily sens sensations. In a similar experiment, they asked men who had just been interviewed by a young lady in the street how attractive they rated this young woman. In one condition, they did this with men in a usable street with no special features. In the other, they asked the subject right after they left a wobbly bridge. And what happened? In the wobbly bridge condition, the lady was rated much higher on attractiveness. The same phenomena took place. They noticed a higher heart rate, unconsciously caused by the height and instability of the bridge, but when asked, their attention was with the lady. And consequently, they projected their physical arousal on the woman. Hey, my heart beats when I think of her, so she must be very beautiful. And this is how it often works. Our bodily signals are an integral part of how we assess situations. People with a high paraplegia, with nerves in the neck and backbone severely damaged, often have no feeling of their body anymore. That is, sensations in the body do not reach the brain. One of the consequences they report is having no or less feelings or emotions anymore. When they hear a friend has died, they know they should be sad, but they don't feel sadness anymore. The cognitive component is still there, but the very important physical component is gone. We need to make sense of the signals of our body and the events in the outside world. The coherent story we make of this we call our identity. This effect is probably an important factor with regard to trauma. We know one of the most important factors in developing post-traumatic stress disorder is the lack of social support. You need a community you can connect with that helps you to fit your experiences and emotions into a coherent and positive story. PTSD isn't only about terrible things you have seen or experienced. It's foremost about your own reactions that were completely out of line with your old identity and your implicit expectations on how you would react. Probably the more realistic soldiers are prepared to what possibly can happen 
and how they will react differently for what they expected, the better they can cope with war situations. Man is a storytelling creature, and the most important story is about the self. But let's go back to the evolutionary side. Emotions do have functions, social functions in many cases. Sadness, for example, first inhibits activity so you can rest. Physically, you take the time to have your body restore itself in case of woundedness. Or mentally, to rearrange your concept of yourself and your social environment. Furthermore, you are sending out signals you need help. You are activating the social capital you have built up in the past. Research shows depressive behaviors indeed does stimulate help from friends and family, but only for a limited amount of time. When it continues for too long, caregivers are going to withdraw, probably because the helping doesn't produce the desired effects. And this is a crucial observation. We are all equipped with evolutionary calculators. Efforts cannot go on endlessly. When, for the helper, it becomes clear investments will not pay off, they will eventually stop. It may be hard to realize, but in evolution, it all centers around selfishness. Helping a friend or member of the tribe may look altruistic, but it's in your own best interest too. But if it reach, but to reach this, the costs are too high, it's better to spend your resources on something else. Sound harsh, but that's how evolution is. In the second part of this video, I will focus my attention on depression and what evolution psychology has to say about it. For this, I lean heavily on the thinking of Randolph Nesser. He wrote his wonderful book, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, Insights from the Frontier of Evolutionary Psychiatry. Many ideas, however, presented before will come back again. We just saw helping doesn't go on forever. Behaviors and responses do have an optimum point. So something effective in one situation can become ineffective some moments later. Let's take a concrete example. Why do babies cry? The incomplete answer is because they experience some form of discomfort, hunger, pain, cold, or seeing danger coming. A more complete answer is, this is their prime means to call for help. Mothers and other caregivers almost immediately respond to the crying of babies and come to help or comfort them. In most cases, by taking away the cause of the discomfort. But in our lives at hunter-gatherers, the crying of the baby was not without risk. Crying catches the ear of the mother, but it might as well attract predators, bringing both the life of the child itself, his mother, and maybe other siblings or members of the group in danger. Some evolutionary psychologists have called the crying of the baby a kind of blackmailing. The mother is not only motivated by helping the baby, but also by as quickly as possible silencing a potential very concrete source of danger in the near vicinity. One could say the baby is playing a highly dangerous game. That's why, in case help does not arrive, the crying will not go on forever. The baby is making a kind of balanced trade-off. On the positive side, the arrival of help. On the negative side, the arrival of lethal danger. The longer the help fails, the more the balance shifts to the negative side. That is why a child will not go on endlessly with crying, but will cease to do so from a certain moment in time. Developmental psychologists, like the famous John Bowley, sometimes frame this as an avoided way of attachment and they label it pathological. If stretched to a permanent way of behaving, it is of course, but in the short and medium run, it can be viewed as a quite healthy response. Maybe in the past, psychology has labeled some behaviors pathological too soon. When seen from an evolutionary perspective, they are sometimes quite healthy and adaptive. Let's discuss one such case that will clarify a lot about the real nature of depressions. Martin Seligman is one of the founders of research on learned helplessness. In his experiments, he put animals in a discomforting situation, for example, a cage with painful electric shocks in the floor. One group of the animals had the opportunity to escape from the pain, the other had not. The second group, of course, tried hard to escape too, but after a while, they gave up and absorbed the painful shocks without any reaction anymore. Interestingly, when these rats or dogs were placed in new conditions, 
where they did have the opportunity to escape the pain, they much more often fell back in the old state of inactivity. Learned helplessness seemed to generalize to new conditions. Seligman presents this set of behaviors as an animal model, animal model for human depressions. The Porcel test is another example of this. It's a means of investigating the effects of, for example, Prozac. Rats are put in water. They have to swim and cannot escape by climbing the inner wall of the bucket. The test measures when the rats give up and stop trying to escape. This is a measure of their tendency to revert to inactivity, which by the researchers is seen as something bad. And indeed, rats given Prozac keep trying much longer than rats that didn't receive this antidepressant drug. But is this a just observation? No, it is not. Why? In nature, for every animal living in harsh condition, there's a breaking point between going on in a certain activity, for instance, actively looking for food and doing so quickly exhausting your reserves, or stopping and retreating in a state of inactivity. This way, saving what's left of your resources to survive and waiting for better times to come. Probably for a lion, this state of inactivity is in itself quite neutral. For a human, it can be too, when he has the cultural stories telling him it is a wise way to act. It may lead to depression and suffering, however, if we attribute this feeling of low energy just as a sign of failure, as something that is only bad, because we lack a better story. And here we may have created an unhealthy situation for ourselves, because in our culture we only have hero stories about action, about endless perseverance, about quitting is no option. And in this state, we precisely are not capable of action, shouldn't be according to evolutionary dictates. Blaming ourselves for inactivity is making it all worse. So we need stories of wise and courageous inactivity. Quitting should be an option, even an heroic one. Different groups, countries, cultures, and ages show remarkable differences in the occurrence of depressions. Might this having to do with the different stories told within these communities? In Japan, for instance, until Western pharmacy landed there, they didn't have a word for depression, let alone it should be something that must be cured. The mental state resembling the closest to depression was something like wiseness, contemplation, and not judging or acting hastily or impulsive. A positive story. We lack these stories. Think of the rats in the water test. Maybe Prozac is just making you do stupid things, stupid from an evolutionary perspective. Giving up, trying when you cannot get out of the water and wait just floating around may be the wisest option. And Prozac is just blocking this. Other research on humans show antidepressants make you less excitable about things. Everything looks a bit less important, both the things that could bring you joy as well the things that would make you sad. Maybe this explains the mindless perseverance of the rats. They didn't bother about the fatigue in their bodies anymore, about our internal signals, which is from an evolutionary perspective a very stupid thing to do. So what society are we creating blocking normal responses with artificial drugs, stimulants or inhibitors? Mind you, in some cases, these forms of inactivity has even evolved to a structural withdrawal when scarcity occurs on a regular and predictable basis. Then we call it hibernation. Depressions in humans often occur when people lose something they value very much, be it physical resources, relationships with important others, or status. Here again, depressions or withdrawal can be a quite functional response. Fighting on while chances of winning are slim is not very wise. In situations, males fight for dominance and status, attacking again and again will wear you out, and the damage of frequent fight might even kill you. Withdrawal physically and making yourself small in posture makes the dominant guys leave you alone. This happens with apes as well as employees not wanting to offend a dominant boss or a wife making herself small for an abusive husband. This gives you time to gather new resources and await better times. Fighting till the end, as sometimes promoted by modern Western masculinity, is not always a wise strategy. 
in most of the time we lived as a species, we had to balance our efforts, enough to get results, but not too much to prevent wasting energy. A period of depression is therefore an important moment to reset your priorities. If one goal or activity doesn't produce the desired results, an endless keep on trying is a silly waste of time. It's better to look for new goals or try out your luck elsewhere. Psychologist Paul Gilbert found out when depressed people formulate new goals, they much sooner get better, regardless from the fact if they are already successful in these new goals or not. So, learned helplessness must not always be viewed as something ne negative, pathological. It's not about giving up, it's just about switching to another strategy. Psychologist Jutta Heckhausen did an elaborate research on women wanting to have children but failed to get pregnant. Their de desperation grew with age, but they still kept hope. You can imagine these women were prone to severe forms of depressions, wanting something very badly and endlessly failing in it. But guess what? At a certain point, the depressions disappeared. And that was when they approached menopause, when it became clear having a baby was factual impossible. So sometimes hope is the strongest cause of depression. Research on cancer and parents with children with cancer showed the same results. Sometimes giving up trying was the best strategy and improved mental well-being. Depression can be a symptom of failing to really letting something go. Also, the ideas of the Swedish psychoanalyst Emmy Good can help us to understand what exactly is going on. She makes a sharp distinction between productive and unproductive depressions. In contrast to the popular view, ruminating and depressions are always unproductive, she shows many people found better strategies to deal with losses of relationships, states, etc., by withdrawal and thinking on problems while experiencing a downy mood. But true, fact is, some people get stuck in an unproductive depression. These are the cases we refer to in popular media, and these are the people seeking professional help for a problematic depression. But don't condemn depression as a whole, because a certain part of it is problematic. So depression certainly isn't always a sign of a distorted brain. It can be a healthy response on specific environmental forces too. By the way, except from Alzheimer's disease and Huntington's disease, there are no psychiatric conditions with proven brain abnormalities. So we should stop treating depression as a disease. The medical model is pointing us in the wrong direction. Evolutionary psychology, cultural sciences and philosophy have much more to tell about this than medicine does. The phenomenon of depression realism points in the direction of a functional adaptation. Much research shows depressed people have a more accurate, clear-cut, objective view on reality. They are better at judging their own competencies, their limitations and the barriers to walk the goal. Optimistic people often wear pink glasses. They have an optimism bias, making them give everything they have and as a self-fulfilling prophecy, consequently, might have a bigger chance of becoming successful. So both optimism bias and depression realism prove functional. Depression can best be viewed as an intermediate state between old goals, proving unobtainable, and new, not yet fully formulated goals or strategies, a kind of limbo. So if you are depressed yourself or are helping someone suffering from depressions, you could ask key questions like, where did you fail? Where was it you were humiliated? Where did you lose status? Where is it you do not feel at home anymore? Or where did these things happen in the near past? Or might these things be going to happen in the near future? Furthermore, we have to realize joy and sadness never are permanent states. They are designed by evolution to be temporary. Happiness occurs when making progress toward an important goals. It's not about possessing things or having reached a goal. Many times, people having all the material wealth one can wish are quite unhappy. Happiness is more about the road than about the destiny. You cannot, even need not, be exhilarated with joy all of the time. Life cannot be one big party. And I don't mean this in a material way, but in a psychological one. Joy and excitement are functional emotions 
to make the maximum use of temporary abundances of resources. Randolph Ness gave the example of our far forefathers discovering a hearth of mammoths to hunt on. Everyone is cheering with excitement. All the energy of the group is activated to make the maximum use of this rare opportunity. But in situations food is accessible in vast quantities for longer stretches of time, it's no use experiencing a permanent state of acceleration. We don't cry with joy every time we visit the supermarket. But to realize this, our far ancestors would. For them, it would be like entering cocaine. The same goes for sadness. It's no use staying sad forever because of some loss. In the short run, this emotion is functional because it helps you to act low key, not stir unwanted attention and create time for yourself to think of new strategies and new goals. If these are reached or circumstances prove they are un unreachable, it's better to go back to your default state of happiness. This very same effect has often been demonstrated in research on happiness. Take someone who won a million dollars in a lottery or someone losing his legs in a terrible accident. When asked the short period after these occurrences, you, they both report the feelings you might expect, happiness or sadness. But what will we see after a longer period of time? Then in most cases, both persons have slowly shifted back to their original state of happiness. Individuals do have a kind of baseline of happiness, and this seems to be dictated by personality traits, which are for the bigger part genetically determined. Especially the big five trait of neuroticism is a powerful predictor of this. So in the end, it's not outside events that dictate our happiness. Listen to the Buddha to learn more about this. Evolutionary psychologist Mark Leary proposed the social media theory on self-esteem. How well you feel is for a substantial part a reflection on how well others judge about you. Your intuitive senses tell us, for example, we are too low on the number of kudos we receive, a rough but important indicator on your social status. In other words, what are you contributing to people around you? Our neocortex has to figure out on what specific points we are lacking, where we don't pull our weight or our contributions are not valued that much meaning ideally to switch to other competencies or niches not yet filled. Details of this process are explained in episode 10 in this series on cooperation and leadership. Low self-esteem is another example of where it is needed to abandon old goals and formulate new ones with the need of your community as a prime criterion for choosing. So people going to therapy and wanting to be helped by them, not minding so much of what other people think of them, in fact are asking the counselor to disrupt their social antennas. And as a doctor shouldn't prescribe painkillers too lightly, pain is a serious warning system, so should our social antennas not lightly be incapacitated. Instead of helping the client, the focus of psychotherapy should switch to help the client to find out how to help other people. His first question should not be, how do I become happy, but instead, how do I make other people happy? And as a side effect, he will become happy himself too. Depressions are complex phenomena. It's about resetting priorities and goals. But on a certain point, you need the energy to really start working to reach them. Here are some quick wins you can use if you struggle with mild forms of depression yourself or stay inactive for too long. These are, have a regular sleep pattern. Do not expose yourself too much to blue or artificial lights in the evening before going to bed. Have a healthy diet with some extra fish oil, for example. And a good breakfast and have plenty of physical exercise, preferably outdoor and in nature. Catch enough sunlight. Don't isolate yourself from others. Note, these very things were probably the reasons our far ancestors, hunter gatherers, did have moments of depressions, but they never got stuck in it as modern people do. These quick wins pull them out as quickly as possible. They were natural medicines against depression. So use them, they are freely available. Furthermore, set yourself challenging physical and intellectual goals. Bring structure and order in your life. Do things that are difficult and important. Train your self-discipline. Toughen up. 
live your life as an anti-fragile system and be proud of that. Help and enjoy your friends and family. Happiness is not found within yourself, but it springs from the community that transcends you. But if you struggle with severe depressions for longer periods of time, do not hesitate to search professional help. Okay, folks, that was it for today. I hope I broadened your scope on emotions and depression. If interested, I really can really recommend the book of Randolph Nasser on evolutionary psychiatry. This was it for today. See you on my next video.